Hello, this is Dr. Michael Shear with Learn Lodi, a free resource for learning how to market, treatment plan, place, and maintain locator overdenture implants. The purpose of today's YouTube video is to describe the surgical placement technique of Zest Lodi implants. Today we're going to be placing four 2.9 millimeter wide by 12 millimeter long Zest Lodi implants on our edentulous dummy mandible. And this is an edentulous mandible that is a styrofoam replica that's meant to just describe a surgical technique. It gives a fair representation of the implant placement for the Zestalodi implant. However, what you're going to tend to find is, is that this type of mandible is going to give you a very low bone density rating. So when you place the implant, it's not going to grab as well. But it gives you a pretty good idea of the actual surgical sequence and technique. So first and foremost, I'm going to put this mandible aside so we can get acquainted with the Zest locator overdenture surgical cassette. Zest manufactures a surgical implant cassette of two different types, either a standard or premium. This happens to be the premium surgical kit, which is everything that you would need to place Zest Lodi implants. First and foremost, you have four diameter osteotomy drills, either a 1.2 pilot, 1.6, 2.1, or 2.4 millimeter diameter drill. And corresponding to the osteotomy drills, you have five different drill stops. These five different drill stops are going to easily snap onto any of the four osteotomy burrs, allowing the clinician to precisely record how much depth they can you know, proceed with their osteotomy. So a physical drill stop is something that I greatly prefer because what I tend to find is, is that as that osteotomy burr is spinning, it sometimes is hard to see those laser lines. A drill extender is also included in the surgical cassette in long clinical crown situations around adjacent teeth. A tissue punch is greatly assisting in flapless procedures where you can make an incision, a very precise incision marking, plucking out the soft tissue. Four directional indicators are also packaged with this cassette, assisting you in providing guidance in terms of parallelism for placement of the implants. A standard locator core tool is provided a torque ratchet, which will insert the ratchet insert and allowing you to attach any of these three drivers that you see right in here. And these three drivers are either the implant drivers, like on the top, you have a short and a long one, or you can utilize the locator insertion insert, which will allow you to torque down the locator housing or the, the locator attachment. The ISO latch driver tip is meant to go into the surgical handpiece, allowing you to place the implant with a handpiece. So first and foremost, I'm going to get you acquainted with the function of the drill stop. So as I go ahead and I take out the 1.2 millimeter pilot drill, and I'm going to zoom in so that way you can see this a little bit better. The 1.2 millimeter drill stop is um, a really nice um, size because it is just small enough to give you the freedom and flexibility to make directional changes as well, as opposed to jumping straight to a 1.8 or, or a 1.6 or a 2.0 millimeter drill. So first and foremost, what we can do is, is we can take a drill stop, and in this case, since we're going to be placing a 12 millimeter long implant, I'm going to grab the 12 millimeter long drill stop, and I can insert that over the osteotomy burr, allowing you to snap it into place. And as you see here, it's got a really nice rigid snap to it. So that way it'll be firmly attached to the drill. However, it has some freedom within the spinning surface of this, allowing you um, in tight situations where you might be contacting bone, it's not going to be overheating that bony crest because this will start spinning if you have a binding effect. This, this same drill stop is also compatible with all the other implant osteotomy drill sizes, including the 1.6 and so on and so on as you see here. The locator core tool is standard within the surgical kit as well, and many of you are familiar with this, the functions of this locator core tool. This will allow you to insert, maintain, and service any locator attachment or housing or nylon insert. The ratchet insert is a really nice device that comes packaged with this cassette. There's an inside and an outside, and this is something called a spring-loaded torque ratchet, as opposed to something that is meant to snap or break away. A ratchet insert allows you to receive any of the instruments that are going to be utilizing for the zest load implant placement or for the locator insertion. Anytime that you um, introduce this ratchet insert into the torque wrench, 
you want to hear a snapping noise, that'll mean that it's down all the way. And then you can take any of your tools, and in this case, this is the short implant driver that'll snap into that square driver receptacle. So they're all utilizing the square driver, utilizing as well this rubber O-ring that will greatly assist you in retention of this. So that way, again, it doesn't fall outside of the instrument, potentially becoming an aspiration risk. So Zest um, packages the Zest Lodi implant in an all-in-one inclusive packaging. As you see here, everything on this cover is included within the package. You get the implant, the attachment, the, the locator attachment, plus the housing, plus three different retention strengths of the, um, the nylon inserts. So in addition to the implant and the attachment, you get the blue, pink, and red extended range attachments, the denture processing cap, with the denture processing male and the white blockout spacer. As I mentioned before, the Zest Lodi implant is unique in the fact that yes, it is a small diameter implant or what's sometimes called a mini. Now I don't like to use the term mini because many patients will tend to think of the term mini and think that it's less valuable or less good. I use the term narrow diameter implant because many patients can relate to the fact that yes, I have a narrow diameter ridge or just a little bit of bone, a narrow bone. And the, the, the term narrow diameter implant fits in very nicely with that. So unique about the Zest Lodi implant that is, is that yes, it is a two piece implant. It's essentially an external hex implant with an internal set screw that will allow you to insert the locator attachment into place. On top of that is, yes, the locator attachment with the pivoting cap that most of you are familiar with. This is the most um, uh, common type of attachment and the most popular attachment on the market in the United States because of its low profile design and its effectiveness. As you can see here, it's a very retentive design, which will allow for greater flexibility in tight clinical situations as well. As I mentioned before, it's a two piece implant. The locator housing or the locator attachment is screwed into place. And essentially, you have an external hex with a top set screw that will allow you to insert the implant. As I mentioned before, you have this coronal flare of the implant, which will allow you to engage the cortical bone, increasing your potential for um, primary stability. Additionally, you have these three cutting flutes in this progressively tapered design, which will allow you to undersize your osteotomy in low um, density bone situations. So by nature, if we create a smaller or a narrower diameter osteotomy in the apical third and a regular size osteotomy in this middle to coronal third, we can engage this tapping nature of this self-tapping implant with the flaring portion, the compressive nature of the top portion of the implant, which will allow for greater flexibility in many bone and differing bone situations. So a couple kind of nuts and bolts thing about the actual locator attachment as well as the Lodi implant treatment planning. I'm going to zoom back out so we can all see. Looking at our dummy mandible and zooming back in just a touch. Looking at our dummy mandible, what the important thing to understand is, is that Zest will sell you and they manufacture two different implant diameters, either a 2.4 or a 2.9, coming in three different lengths, either a 10 millimeter, 12 or 14 millimeter length. So the flexibility that you have with this implant system is tremendous. So when we start to think about treatment planning and placement of these implants to fit within this edentulous mandible like you see in front of you, you start to think, okay, well, I can place four 2.4 millimeter implants, and if I only need them to be two to three millimeters apart, I could potentially space them out center to center approximately five millimeters. Well, a couple of things that are important to understand about the actual Lodi implant is, is that, yes, the implant itself might be 2.4 millimeters, but the thing to understand is, is that the locator attachment is much wider than that. The locator attachment is somewhere right around 3.85 millimeters, just the attachment itself. So if I do a measurement of the locator, you can see here I'm right around 3.85, 3.88, somewhere in that range. So there is a flare that's going to be occurring as you get from the platform to the top of the, of the locator attachment. As you see here, 
Yes, this portion right here might be 2.4 millimeters, but the actual locator is standard between the 2.9 and 2.4 or any locator attachment used on any implant company. The width, 3.85 millimeters. And importantly, on top of that, if we put the locator housing cap, that also adds width. So if we start to measure these things, we start to really realize that we have to take into consideration the business end of the locator attachment. Because if we start to think, well, since I'm a, uh, placing a 2.4 millimeter implant, I can place them a lot narrower than I can a traditional implant, can be a tricky proposition. Because while the locator attachment itself is 3.85 to 3.88 millimeters, the locator housing is somewhere right around 5.5 millimeters, somewhere in that range. So if we allow for one millimeter of acrylic resin minimum between housings, that means we have to really consider a much wider spacing between these four implants as a minimum recommendation. So typically what I recommend is, is I recommend at least seven millimeters from center to center of each implant. So if we think about it, if we have a housing that's from this portion to this portion is 5.5 millimeters and we want an additional one millimeter of acrylic resin completely surrounding this locator housing, that really means we need to be a minimum of 6.5 millimeters from center to center. So on average, 6.5 is kind of a hard measurement. Sometimes people will undershoot that number. I just recommend seven millimeters from center to center as a minimum. And many times, especially in the older population, you might get a significant amount of bone resorption. And bone resorption typically affects the posterior mandible first before it would affect the anterior mandible. So this type of clinical situation might be preferred where we can get a better AP spread of these implants. And in situations where we have enough alveolar bone height in com combination with enough prosthetic height, meaning that there's enough room within that denture to allow for the components to attach to the denture properly, well then yes, absolutely, we can place implants distal to the foramen. But what I can tell you is, is that from my own clinical practice experience, I tend to find that most patients are somewhere in the zone of the anterior interforaminal bone allotment. They typically have more bone here to here in between the foramen. So if I were just to kind of do a quick mark of where I think the patient's foramen is right in here, somewhere in here, and maybe somewhere down in here, maybe I can kind of bump this down just a little bit, somewhere right down in there. So there we go. Our typical recommendation is, is that we want to recommend that somewhere, get rid of that top mark, because typically mental foramen are not that high up, especially in this bone situation. We typically recommend a five millimeter minimum anterior placement of an implant in relation to the mental foramen. And if we think about that, the maximum amount of loop of an inferior alveolar nerve is somewhere right around three millimeters as described by Carl Misch. So if we want a two millimeter safety zone from any sort of critical anatomy, that means we need to respect the three millimeter loop plus a two millimeter safety zone. So hence we get the five millimeter recommended distance, safety distance from the mental foramen. And looking at the interforaminal space, we know that we can just arbitrarily put in implants. Or can we? Or should we? As I mentioned before, I tend to recommend clinically that we place implants seven millimeters apart. Now, what I like to do is, is I like to take an edentulous mandible, and everything that you see right in front of you right now, you can go ahead and take to a patient. So you can sterilize a golf pencil like this, also have ready a Bowley gauge preset to seven millimeters. These are both things that I use surgically. What I like to do, first and foremost, is, is I like to make a midline measurement. So just with my pencil, I'm gonna make a midline measurement. And now I can base a lot of my measurements from that initial midline measurement. So you say to yourself, okay, well, from center to center, I can be right around seven millimeters. So I can place an implant right in the midline, right? 
Well, yes, you can do that, but typically I recommend avoiding that exact midline symphysis area. I like to place my implants just lateral to the midline, here and just lateral here, and then seven millimeters from the distal of each one of those implants. So if my implant needs to be seven millimeters apart, from the midline, I'm gonna make a measurement of 3.5 millimeters and 3.5 millimeters. And that gives you a great starting point to place a zest loading implant. And in my case, I tend to have a little bit difficulty with having to reset a bully gauge several times. So I just go ahead and I take a bully gauge and I, and I mark it already to seven millimeters, put it right around in the middle of where my midline marking is and the bully gauge corresponding. And then I just go ahead and I draw a mark here. And I draw a mark here. And I do another quick measurement to make sure I'm seven millimeters apart. And again, right around like that and right around like that making sure that I'm roughly center with the alveolar bone and roughly center with the midline. At that point, I also go ahead and I take another mark, seven millimeters to the distal to that, approximately right here. And then also distal to that, seven millimeters, right around in there. And now I'm gonna go ahead and further accentuate that marking and these markings like you see right in here. Making sure that I'm right in line with where I think those implants should be placed. So this is our surgical plan. And our surgical plan is going to allow for a really safe safety zone between the mental foramen and those distal terminal implants. Now if you do feel more comfortable with making large flap elevation and localizing and finding the mental foramen, of course, you can push your implants further back to get a better AP spread. But typically what I recommend to clinicians is, is that if you follow this cookbook treatment plan for the Zest Lodi implant, you're going to be safe. Now, of course, use your clinical judgment. Don't just use a cookbook. Make sure that you tailor all of your implant surgeries to your patient and the safety of their clinical situation. But I tend to find that this works really, really well in most clinical situations. So let me zoom out just a touch so you all can see. There we go. One additional step that you can and can't do is, is you can use a caliper, a ridge mapping caliper of like what you see here, just to get an idea of what your ridge width is right in here. And as you see here, this is obviously a dummy mandible. I've got 10 millimeters of bone. I've got even more right in here, probably right around 12 millimeters of bone. So we're good to go. And a lot of this is covered in the Zest Locator Overdenture Technique Manual. So as you see here, I'm just going to do a quick review of the actual technique manual. We'll zoom out here. Move that to the side, move that to the side. All of this information is covered in great depth in this technique manual and um, compounding upon those treatment planning things that I just talked about. Also as a review, you can see here that it does describe each one of the instruments that are in the, the premium surgical kit. All the different potential configurations that you can do for the Zest Lodi implant. One thing to note, Zest also sells two different cuff heights, meaning that they sell two different heights of locator attachments, either a 2.5 or a 4 millimeter tall attachment. And you can also specify which of those you want. Now what I can tell you is, as I recommend from my clinical experience, our entire stock is with a 2.5 millimeter cuff height. Because what I do is, is I keep a small stock of 4 millimeter tall abutments, because in deep tissue situations when I'm doing flapless procedures, I can then switch out the 2.5 for a four millimeter tall abutment, saving my 2.5 millimeter abutment for a later clinical situation. This technique manual also covers a lot of the sterilization and surgical treatment plan indications, contraindications, storage and handling, and such. Also for your dental assistants, it covers for some sterilization protocols, how you should clean your instruments, how you should clean your surgical tray, and then use and maintenance of the torque ratchet. <clears throat> Further uh, in greater deep detail is the drilling depth control sheet indicating where your laser lines are marking, whether it's 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, or 18 with the laser line. But again, I typically find that I find it much easier to use the drill stop in combination with the uh, um, laser depth markings or with the, um, the osteotomy drills. Also included is a recommendation of the surgical drilling protocol for different bone situations, whether it's D1, D2, D3, or D4. 
and then also a cookbook recipe of surgical placement protocols for either a 2.4 or a 2.9 millimeter implant. And as you see here, this top area describes a D1 bone, and these the middle one describes a D2, D3, and then the bottom one describes a D4 bone. What you'll find is, is that with the 2.4 millimeter by 12 millimeter implant osteotomy preparation technique, you're typically going to recommend using a 1.2 millimeter pilot to full depth, a 1.6 millimeters to full depth in D1 bone, and then four millimeters short with a 2.1 millimeter drill, inserting the implant till it stops. For D2, D3 bone, what you're gonna do is you're gonna use the 1.2 millimeter to full depth, However, then you're going to use the second drill, which is the 1.6 8 millimeter drill stop, 4 millimeters short. Again, you're going to create the stepped osteotomy preparation so that way you can engage coronally as well as apically, inserting the implant until it stops and then ratcheting to full depth. In D4 bone, it's very, very similar, but many times in real D4 bone, I would even recommend just cutting out the second drill and just placing with just that first drill. A 2.9 millimeter implant is placed in a similar fashion, in a similar technique, except that you would use one additional osteotomy drill. So case in point, in a D2, D3 bone, you would use the 1.2 millimeter pilot um, drill to full osteotomy depth. However, then you'd use the 1.6 also to full depth, and then the 2.1, four millimeter short, and in this case, a eight millimeter drill stop corresponding to a 12 millimeter long implant. Further included in the instruction and the technique manual is information regarding the locator um, attachment, including which types of male attachments you can use, a review of the core tool and the technique of how to utilize it, as well as basic clinical protocol, which I have just discussed. What I tend to recommend is, is either a ridge map or tissue depth measurement uh, preoperatively. Many times I do recommend radiology confirmation of the implant site whether you're using a panoramic radiograph with ball bearings like you see here, or a comb beam CT. And in this case, using the denture as a guide with a um, uh, surgical guide fabricated from the denture. Now again, these are the procedures that I'm going to be covering in greater depth. The first initial preparations with the 1.2 millimeter osteotomy drill, pilot, to full depth. And in a flapless situation, you would use a um, tissue punch but in this case, we're not going to be um, doing a flapless procedure. You can always look at other YouTube videos that I have on Learn Lodi, which will describe the flapless technique and the guided flapless technique. After you do your initial pilot drill, again, you're gonna use your second drill, which is the 1.6 millimeter drill with the full drill stop length for the 2.9 millimeter implant, followed by the eight millimeter drill stop or four millimeter short of your total length with the 2.1 millimeter drill. And I'm gonna to talk to you about packaging a little bit, but the implant can be attached to the handpiece driver, the iso latch driver, removed from the vial and inserted into the implant site and ratcheted down until full depth. One thing I caution you to do is, is to not put the locator attachment on here first before ratcheting to full depth. Make sure the implant is ratcheted to full depth prior to placement of the locator attachment. Because once the locator attachment goes into place, it's recommended not to um, torque this above 30 newton centimeters. We're not going to be covering the denture technique and the pickup instructions because that'll be done at a later date. But you can tune into other YouTube videos that will describe this in greater detail because a lot of this will be covered in subsequent video series. So now we've made we've made our panoramic radiograph or our cone beam CT X-ray and we're ready to begin the surgical placement of the loading implants. We have our four sites marked. Let me go ahead and I'm gonna correct that angulation just a little bit. There we go, and there we go. So we have our four implant sites marked already. We have our midline marked, and we're ready to begin the surgical preparation. First step is I'm gonna take my surgical handpiece. This happens to be an aseptico um, handpiece unit. I'm going to take the 1.2 millimeter pilot drill, insert it into the handpiece chuck, and I'm going to take the 12 millimeter drill stop, what you see here, and you can snap it into place. And this is something that you can do in traditional techniques. What I like to do, just to really ensure parallelism between four implants, is I take the 8 millimeter drill stop, snap it onto the 1.2 millimeter drill, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark a midline guide pin. 
And that midline guide pin is going to assist me in parallelism of all the implants and the, the implant osteotomy preparation. So I've got my handpiece um, unit um, set to 1200 RPMs. You could go lower, you could place it uh, as little as 800, or you can go higher, you can place it as high as 1500. What I typically recommend is somewhere right around that range, and if you feel more comfortable with lower RPMs, that is perfectly fine. The first step is to go ahead and take your 1.2 with your 8 millimeter osteotomy um, drill stop right at your midline marker. And what I like to do is, is run this at full speed, creating an initial pilot osteotomy hole, just like you see here. And I'm going to remove my bone chips with just hair. And now what I like to do is I like to take a directional indicator and sliding it into place. And that will allow me to verify my implant angulation is correct. And in this case, what I've done is, is I've uh, purposely misangled it just a little bit. Because what I'd like to do is, is now correct it ever so slightly. And the correction is better to occur at this stage as opposed to when you're drilling your actual osteotomy sites. Because the actual osteotomy sites, once you over enlarge them, it's sometimes difficult to get primary insertion torque. So I'm going to remove my directional indicator and I know I need to correct slightly to the patient's right. Again, cleaning off my bone chips and placing my directional indicator back in. And now I'm much more satisfied with my implant angulation that we, than we had before, as you see here. So the next step is to go ahead and remove my eight millimeter drill stop, placing my drill stop that corresponds with my full implant length. As I mentioned before, we're gonna be placing four 2.9 millimeter by 12 millimeter long Lodi implants. I'm gonna take out my 12 millimeter drill stop. And I'm gonna begin by drilling my first osteotomy site using my guide pin as a parallel indicator. And the key is, is that you're going to want to pump this up and down, ensuring that adequate irrigation gets down all the way to the base of the osteotomy. Okay. Cleaning off my bone chips. Second step is to go on to the next osteotomy. I'm going to move that one just a hair to the distal so it doesn't bump. There we go. And pumping up and down to ensure that I get adequate irrigation down to the osteotomy and I'm going to clean off my bone chips just like you see here. Now at this point what I like to do is I'm going to zoom in just a touch so you can see our parallels in a little bit better. There we go. And now I can take my additional directional indicators sliding them into place allowing me to get really precise parallelism. So the parallelism of this is really pretty critical, especially once we get above two Lodi implants. Anytime that you have two, three, four locator attachments, period, it's always recommended to make sure that they're as parallel as possible. Even though the Zest Company will sell extended range locator male inserts, that is more of a safety mechanism for when cases don't go ideal. The ideal situation is to make these as parallel as possible. So the next step is to go ahead and start osteotomy preparation in my posterior sites, lining up the parallelism to the anterior, finding my hole, and then going ahead and drilling. And again, pumping up and down, and pumping up and down, and pumping up and down. There we go. And cleaning up my bone chips on my implant site and placing my directional indicator. We're starting to get really nice parallelism here. Next step, moving on to my final site. And again, pumping my osteotomy to ensure I have adequate irrigation. Typically that doesn't happen because I'm not going to be supporting my patient like that. Cleaning off my site and transferring my midline osteotomy measurement or my directional indicator to my posterior site. 
drop in there, there we go. So now we're going to start to get a good game plan of where we are. There we go. And that's our goal for our parallelism. Looking at it from the occlusal, as well as from the facial, and from the lateral. So overall, a pretty ideal clinical situation. The next step is, is we're going to be enlarging our osteotomy with full 12 millimeter long drill stop with our 1.6 millimeter osteotomy burr. So grabbing the 1.6 millimeter osteotomy drill and snapping on the 12 millimeter drill stop, I can go ahead and remove one of the directional indicators and beginning my osteotomy preparation, falling into that same hole, pumping up and down, and it should just drop right into place. Same thing here, I can remove that. Following my posterior guides, and just dropping into place. And now at this point, what I like to do is go ahead and clean off our sawbones mandible. What I like to do is, is I like to go ahead and I like to take that original directional indicator, and on one side of the directional indicator is a 1.2 millimeter diameter, and on the other side is a 1.6. So now I've created a 1.6 millimeter osteotomy. That other side of the directional indicator should slide nicely into place. So as you see here, this is the upside down version of that one right there. So this is gonna permit me to visualize my long axis in my implant placement for the purposes of the second osteotomy. I'm gonna remove that terminal one, come back in here, find my initial hole, follow my parallelism, and just pump up and down, cleaning off my bone chips. Again, popping that into place. There we go, there we go. Removing that one, and the same thing here. Hello, that just is falling out, there we go. Pumping up and down again. There we go, sliding that back in. Cleaning off my bone chips, putting my final directional indicator back in. So again, what I'm doing is I'm following the original plan. Nice parallelism for where I'm supposed to be. There we go, good. And from the lateral direction as well, and very nice. And there we go, very, very nice. Okay, so the next step is, is we're going to be utilizing our final burr. So I'm going to remove the 12 millimeter drill stop from the 1.6 millimeter um, osteotomy drill. Pop that out of my handpiece. Take the 2.1 millimeter drill with the 8 millimeter drill stop. And the 8 millimeter drill stop is going to create, again, a stepped osteotomy preparation in the apical third. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that first directional indicator, keeping my parallelism, and up and down nice and easy. There we go. Same thing here, removing that directional indicator and falling into that osteotomy. Making sure to pump up and down. up and down and removing that last one and you can see here you can try to put that back in that other osteotomy but it doesn't work that well there we go and our final osteotomy following our parallelism there we go cleaning off our bone chips now at this point I can go ahead and remove my 8 millimeter drill stop remove my 2.1 millimeter drill and I can clean off my site. And typically at this point, I would uh, recommend irrigation down to the base of the osteotomy. So since we're really working with a sawbones mandible, it's not that critical, but for the purposes of live patient care, I would definitely recommend irrigation to the base of the osteotomy. So now, as I mentioned before, the all-in-one packaging includes the implant, plus the housing, plus the attachment. If I were to carefully open the packaging, it becomes self-sealed, with the reference number and the lot number of the implant. In this case, this one is a sample. 
I can remove the packaging, which is sterile, and have my assistant drop that onto my sterile field like that. Now here, this is a self-contained vial. Inside of the vial, you see here I've got the locator attachment snap in the snap cap top. If I lightly unscrew this here, you can see here that's where the implant is being held, and that can snap back onto place. So the first step is, is I'm going to go ahead and take my short implant driver, as you see here, attach it to my handpiece. Pardon me. That was, there we go. Let me rephrase that. I'm going to take my ISO latch driver and I'm going to attach it to my handpiece. The short driver goes into the um, uh, torque ratchet. And for the purposes of today's exercise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert these right two implants with a handpiece and then these left two ones by hand with two different techniques. So the first step, as I mentioned before, is to take the ISO latch driver. We're going to remove the vial cap and I'm going to snap that onto the implant and it creates a snapping form because there's a little internal o-ring inside of this ISO latch driver and that will allow you to hold the implant in place so that way as you insert it into the mouth you're not going to get that implant to fall. So now I'm going to switch to my tapping insertion mode and in this case what I like to do is, is I like to insert the implant at 50 RPMs with 25 Newton centimeters of torque. As I start to do that I'm going to carefully take this to the mouth following parallelism. There we go. And because it's a self-tapping nature implant, as I start to insert it, I can rotate the implant in various positions. So I want to be careful how much I turn and twist this implant. So I'm going to try to hold this as parallel as possible until it starts to grab. And there we go. And if I grab right here and it torques out, I mean it starts beeping, I've reached 25 Newton centimeters where it's right there, that's perfect. Because then what I can do is I can start to insert the rest by hand with the torque ratchet. The second implant that I'm going to be inserting with the handpiece, I'm going to give you a demonstration of what it is when the implant does not torque down all the way. Or when it does not go down all the way, when it over torques. So I'm going to insert my implant, just like you see here. Nice and slowly going into place. and beep, 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 the implant has stopped right here. So if the implant stops this tall or this high up with it, you know, somewhere right around three or more threads exposed, I don't recommend trying to tighten this implant down. What you need to do is, is you need to remove that implant, over prepare your osteotomy site ever so slightly, and then go back in with your placement. So I now have the inside, I'm gonna flip it to the outside, snap on my ratchet insert, and then my short implant driver. I'm going to snap onto the top of the implant and then just carefully remove it, just like so. You could also back it out with your surgical handpiece. However, what I typically recommend is, is that this is, this is a procedure that should be done by hand. Now sometimes it won't snap out easily. I'll usually separate like that unscrew this last portion and then it should just snap right out. There you go. Ready to come out. And this will uh, you know, typically be covered with a little bit of heme. You're going to drop it back into your vial just like so. Let your assistant hold that vial. Remove your isolatch driver and take your handpiece and since we set it to eight millimeters with your 2.1, I'm gonna set it to my full implant length, which is 12 millimeters. Come back in here and slightly over prepare my osteotomy. Here, following our parallelism. Oop, I'm on torque insertion mode. There we go. Switch back over to 1200 RPMs. And I'm gonna grab bony here, and then I'm gonna go down fully into place. Sometimes I'll kind of give it a little bit of a wobble, and then now we're ready for implant insertion. I'm going to irrigate my osteotomy again. And now you can see I've slightly over widened my osteotomy as compared to the others. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and take my implant just by hand, 
and start to slowly insert. There we go. My torque indicating ratchet is going to go back to the inside and then I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to ratchet that into place. Nice and slowly until that implant is fully seated. Okay, once I start feeling resistance, I can check the torque value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my finger on one top of it and verify that I'm right around 30 newton centimeters and that implant is now down at the platform level, as you see here. Same thing here. I haven't checked my torque value yet. I'm just going to do a quick check of that, right around 25 newton centimeters. Now remember, this is kind of a sawbone, so you're not going to get high torque values like what you would get on a natural patient. Now, for the next procedure, what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert completely with my insertion ratchet. So here, I'm going to remove my implant. And this is going to go directly into the mouth like that. And I'm just going to slowly start inserting. Now what I find is, is that this is not my preferred way of inserting these implants because there's a lot of wobble that can occur at this point as opposed to a handpiece. The handpiece, you don't get as much of the wobble. And you can tend to lean a little bit with this if you're not careful. So again, I recommend insertion done mostly by the handpiece except in cases on the maxilla where I like to insert the most of the cases by hand initially just because I'm undersizing my osteotomy quite a bit. Again, I'm starting to feel some resistance. I'm going to start checking my spring value. Not there yet. Right at the bone level. Again, right around 25, 30 newton centimeters. It's starting to look pretty good here. And then the final procedure is kind of what I showed you already with that implant that didn't torque down all the way. The only difference is that instead of with the torque indicating ratchet, I'll just go ahead and grab it by hand like that and then slowly start to insert until I feel resistance and then switching over until your torque ratchet uh, is ready to be utilized. Once you start to get a lot of finger resistance right around there, popping that off carefully, keeping the tongue away, snapping my driver insert onto there, and then just starting to take it down. Now again, typically, you know, this type of motion would be a little bit fast if you are uh, new at this. I would go ahead and start out nice and slow, allowing the bone to expand as you're inserting. And as I'm inserting that implant, I'm right around the platform level. There we go. Checking my torque value right around 25, 30 newton centimeters. So now I've got my four Lodi implants in place and this gives me an opportunity just to kind of quickly review where we are placement wise. So I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so you all can see. There we go. So this is pretty ideal Lodi implant placement. If I were to look at my directional indicator, as you see here, that's where my directional indicator was originally and that's where my four Lodi implants are. Let me back out a little bit because it's a little fuzzy. There you go. There's my directional indicator with my four implants and my four implants. Again, removing that directional indicator. There we go. And overall, pretty nice placement. So again, I'm going to verify my distance with a bully gauge. You know, somewhere right around seven millimeters from center to center. And again, right around seven millimeters. And I'm a little bit closer together here than I would have liked, but I did push this one a little bit more distal. But we're right around six and a half, somewhere in that range. So overall, pretty good. So at this point, once the implants are in place, you verify the torque values. And in my case, I've got right around 25 Newton centimeters for all my implants. Typical loading recommendation is right around 30 Newton centimeters minimum insertion torque. Once you hit 30 Newton centimeters, then the recommendation is, is you could load the implants, i.e. connected to the denture. If you're below 30, 
Sometimes some clinicians will advocate for 25 newton centimeters as being acceptable to load. Typically at this point, Zest Anchors is recommending 30 newton centimeters or higher. If you have less than 30 newton centimeters, in a flap situation, you would go ahead and close everything up with sutures, do a soft liner inside the complete denture, and then allow the patient to wear that for somewhere between six to eight weeks to allow for integration of that implant. In a flapless situation, if you have less than 30 newton centimeters, you could either create recess within the denture, a hole, so that way there's not intimate contact of the locator within the denture, and it's essentially going to be still a tissue supported complete denture, or you can create a hole and then also place a soft liner inside of there. This is the technique I generally advocate for most clinicians is to use soft liners around Lodi implants, especially when placing, just because I tend to find that uh, it allows for a little bit more um, a leniency when it comes to the patient chewing or moving his tongue around, et cetera, et cetera. So now at this point, we're ready to go ahead and insert our locator attachments. We're going to be opening up our core tool which we can put these two parts aside for now because this is the portion that's going to be allowing you to be inserting the locator attachments into the mouth. As you see here, I already have put on this little clear plastic cap. And that clear plastic cap is going to allow you to snap the locator attachment inside of um, the core tool. As I mentioned before, that cap has the uh, locator attachment on there, a 2.5 millimeter cuff height. I can take that and then very carefully snap that onto there. And now what's nice is, is that it's no longer an aspiration risk and you're not gonna drop it on the floor. If that doesn't work for you, because I know a lot of times with my surgical assistant, you know, she can't necessarily get that to line up easily. Another technique is you insert that, oh, wrong side. You insert that onto the triangle portion of that driver tip and then you slide the plastic part over it so that way you can verify that it is down all the way. There you go. And this one definitely is going nowhere. With finger pressure, I just insert the locator attachment until I feel resistance and then just snap it off, as you see here. And I carry on with the other four attachments. There we go. Looking good. And the next one. There we go. And then the final one. So overall, nice clean Lodi preparation and implant placement for the 2.9 by 12 millimeter Lodi implant. At this point, what I would recommend you to do is to go ahead and make a panoramic radiograph confirming that our implants at their correct depth in relation to anatomical structures, as well as the um, uh, attachment is fully into place in flapless situations. In flap situations, it's not critical to make a panorex right away. You can delay until after you've closed up your patient because you're directly visualizing where the, um, the locator attachment is fully adapted to the platform. So really, in this area, what I want to make sure is, is that if you want to, you can take an explore just to make sure that I have this properly seated down all the way right in these areas, and then right in these areas. I typically recommend not introducing scratching or you know an explore use in the implant site. However, just a minor touching is not going to be affecting the implant at this point. So as you see here, our four locators are in place and the Lodi surgery is right around complete. However, doctors, don't forget, we need to go ahead and torque our locator attachment completely down. Now, if you have only achieved 25 newton centimeters of torque in the recommended situation is, is that you should only torque your locator attachment up to 25 newton centimeters. 
If you have 30 newtons or higher, you can then torque your locator to a maximum of 30 newton centimeters of insertion torque or of uh, torque. So what I'm gonna do is grab the locator driver tip on the inside of my um, torque ratchet, inserting the triangular portion into the, the locator attachment, and then just tightening down until I hit 25 newton centimeters. And I'm gonna continue on all the way across. There we go. 25 newton centimeters. And for these last two, I'm gonna leave it zoomed in at this position so that way you can see the action end. There we go. And this one's really low density, so it's kind of spinning on me a touch. Which sometimes you'll find clinically as well, doctors. There we go. We're also going to insert that. There we go. Holding my handpiece straight. There we go. And again, saw bones, mandibles are really low density. So now I've torqued. The Panorex has already confirmed I'm in the correct position. I, be, I can begin my suturing protocol. And in most clinical situations, you can use any suturing material that you so desire for a flap situation. Typically, I like interrupted chromic gut sutures. However, you can also use Vicro, you can use Silk, you can use Gore-Tex if you so desire. In flapless situations, we're not going to need um, sutures in most cases unless you decide to elevate a mini flap. Mini flaps are things that we typically recommend in maxillary cases as well if you're unsure of where the bony crest is going to be. And at this point, again, I would recommend a soft liner inside of the denture and then instructing the patient to go easy on this for approximately six to eight weeks, soft food diet for a minimum of two weeks. There we go, there's our final result. And we're gonna zoom in just a touch. Let's see if that focuses. There we go. So this is Dr. Michael Shearer with Learn Lodi, a free resource for learning how to market treatment plan, place and maintain locator overdenture implants. We've successfully placed four 2.9 millimeter diameter by 12 millimeter long Zest Lodi implants interferaminally on the edentulous mandible. Stay tuned for other surgical as well as benchtop demonstration videos for Zest Lodi implants, a resource that will allow you to feel more comfortable in your clinical practices as you either begin or continue your development with Zest Lodi implants. Mm -hmm.